Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next Star Wars video. This is going to be the first in a series of videos as we build up to the release of Star Wars Episode Nine: The Rise of Skywalker. And I think the best way to build up to it is to go back and re-take a look at, um, like re-review, uh, discuss the previous eight movies in what we now know as the Skywalker Saga. Nine movies together that will be ending in December. So, we're going to start off with Star Wars Episode 1, The Phantom Menace. Uh, I think this is the best place to start. It's Episode 1, even though it wasn't the first uh, Star Wars movie released. Um, because we're talking about building up to the end of the Skywalker Saga, I think we should start from the beginning of the saga and go to the end in episode order rather than release order. So, yeah, th th this, uh, I also want to just put out some more Star Wars content to my channel as we build up to... You know, The Mandalorian coming out, I want to cover that, and also the movie which I will be reviewing. So uh, I thought it's best to do it this way rather than just review the movie when it first comes out and like not have any build up to it at all. So you guys know probably if you've seen any of my previous Star Wars videos that I love the prequel trilogy. I've never had any real issues over the course of those three movies with them. I've always been a fan of them, one, two, and three. And to a degree, I've never properly, I think, understood why they got so much criticism at the time. In fact, now, it's been very interesting to see them be a little bit more respected now that we have movies that are once again controversial for Star Wars, where people don't really, a lot of people don't really like the sequel trilogy. Some people do really like them, but again, it's it's the same sort of controversial thing, and it's hard to judge if, like, the prequels were were more disliked than the sequel trilogies are by, by those people, uh, which is which, and like, do, do people just like the prequels now because the sequels aren't so great or, or what? It, it's, been, it, it's been very interesting to kind of see that kind of pattern play out. I very much lie on the side of, I think the prequel trilogies are much better than the sequel trilogy. We'll see how 9 does, but uh, I think there is a lot of pressure on episode 9 to do everything, and I don't know if it's going to be able to bring it all together. But we're here to talk about episode 1. And I've always adored this movie. It's not my favorite Star Wars movie. It's probably like two or three, honestly, for me. Somewhere like that. Uh, Revenge of the Sith is my favorite Star Wars movie. But this one, I've always loved. And watching it last night for the first time in a few years, I watched it with a grin on my face the entire time. The amount of quotes I remembered, I was able to just, you know, say along with the movie as it played out. Um, there wasn't a dull moment for me. And I think that's the thing with that really stood out to me watching this again, is that it's so different than the originals. It's so different than the sequel trilogy. And it works because it's different. It truly stands out compared to the um, other two um, you know, trilogies of movies. And because it's so different, I think that's why I end up liking it so much. The era that we're in here with more Jedi around, we're not immediately stuck in a sort of rebellion-like faction versus an empire-like faction like the other two movies, which very much limits kind of what they can do. The fact that this is just a movie where like we're at peace and it's like the beginning of a greater kind of threat, a greater plan, and it just gives the option to kind of tell a different type of story, I think works so well. And, and that's why I like, I, like I'll always read the novels from the prequel era because they can do so much. When you, when you set them before the Clone War, Wars, you're in an era of peace, so you can do like anything, a little threat here, a little threat there. The Clone Wars has already showcased that you can tell so many different types of stories with such an interest in conflict like that. And, you, you know, just I, I think there's just a mountain of you know potential in this era because I think a lot of people really, really like the Jedi. And so having the most Jedi around that you've had in any of the movies is a great potential for storytelling. And it's always been one of my criticisms of like looking at the, the saga as like a whole is that we're now going to be in a situation where like six of nine movies focused on a situation where the Jedi were either in a state where there was like only one or two out there 
and we only focus on like three movies when the Jedi Order, which has been in the grander state of the universe, like around for so long, we only actually get to see that in a handful of movies. Everything else is like, you know, the, the Jedi in a state of disrepair at some point, and I think we need to go back to that, and that's why like I'd always be, in terms of movies that I want after we end the, the Skywalker saga, I want to see Old Republic. I want to see them do a movie where you have all the Jedi, but you also have all the Sith. You have both factions big and in a slightly different scenario. I want to see them go back to that so you can tell a more a different story and it's not just all about, you know, what is the next thing that we can do to take out the new Jedi Order or something like that. So that's just sort of my kind of opening statement on just the era of the prequels. Let's get into episode one. So as I said, I like this movie a lot, um, but a lot of people don't. And, and it's interesting because this, I think of all of the movies, is the one where you can most clearly focus in on what people specifically don't like. Uh, it's so interesting that like, when, if you look at episode two or even three, there's like little things here and there that people will point out for like, I don't like this or this. But one is the one where there's the most obvious like, I don't like the fact that there's so much politics in it. Uh, I don't like the fact that they sort of reveal midichlorians here and stuff like that. And it's just like, I don't really, they're not criticisms I have and I don't really get some of those criticisms in a way, given like the, the general plot of those movies. And so I'm, I'm gonna start off by addressing those kind of key common criticisms of this. So first of all is the politics, which, is the one I always see leveled at this movie especially, but most of the prequel trilogies. And the way people go on, they act like the entire movie is just, you know, two hours of the characters sitting around and talking about trade negotiations, taxation, stuff like that. When in reality, there's like two or three, maybe four scenes set in the Senate, um, and a similar amount of scenes maybe of them like referencing stuff outside of the Senate. The movie, doesn't really linger on any of those topics. Sure, the opening crawl opens up with the idea of, you know, taxation of trade routes is causing a problem, Naboo's been blockaded, but the point that's getting across is, okay, a planet has been blockaded, there needs to be a reason for it, so we have to actually come up with something. We'll just say it's because of the taxation of trade routes, and there's your conflict straight away. Boom. They're angry at the taxation, so they're blockading a planet until it's changed. Uh, and we see them go further than they're allowed to, um, and that's where the conflict comes in. The Senate is not doing anything to help Naboo. Who's going to benefit the most from that? The Senator of Naboo, who is Palpatine, who is the Emperor. And guess what? The guy who caused the blockade is the same person. So he causes a situation where he can get sympathy from it, and ends up manipulating Padme to voting in no confidence in the current chancellor, and of course, because of the situation he's in, he gets the vote, he gets the position, and he benefits from it. Very, you know, simple, you know, political manipulation, but it's a nice plot. I think people act like the Phantom Menace is Cloak of Deception, that it just lingers on, on politics and politics forever and ever and ever. This book does that. The Phantom Menace really doesn't, because in the grand scheme of things, they don't actually go in depth into what actually happened to cause this situation. Yes, the taxation trade routes is a problem, but they don't go into the whole idea of like what both of these two books kind of cover to a certain degree, which is that um, they're also arguing about like, we should be able to arm our trade ships for shipping around the place because we're constantly being attacked by pirates. And there's discussions about how much uh, weaponry should they be allowed to have uh, how much uh, weaponry will cause it to become like an army of the Trade Federation and, you know, how much is too much but also allowing them to protect themselves because they are still a business. They're the villains, but they are still running a business fundamentally in all of this. And so they don't go into any of that here. They just leave it on the idea of it's a simple thing. They're annoyed about taxation, but in reality, they're being manipulated by Sidious to just do what he wants. He doesn't care about Nuke Gunray fundamentally and will just use him because he like is the leader of the Trade Federation. So po politically, I actually think 
this movie is good because it's political political and, and you had to do that because you have to tell the origin story of the emperor where does he come from how do we get such a shift from a republic to uh, an empire and that is going to involve politics and i don't think they overdo it the only scene where you can in any way say that they cover politics and it's boring is purposefully meant to be that way to force the situation where padme has to vote uh, the, it has to cause the vote of no confidence in Valorum. And it's that situation that I think actually works really well. Padme gives her impassioned speech to the Senate about how her people are dying and she needs help now. And the first response is that she's immediately interrupted by the Trade Federation. They come up and are just like, baseless accusations, can you prove this, that there's uh, anything happening down on the planet, we're allowed to legally have our blockade, you need to prove this, send a committee down there, we'll organize it. Then another guy comes up from a different planet and is just like, yeah, I agree with that, You're, these accusations need to be proven, form the committee, and it's just like, that will take too long, we need to act now, people are dying, and so this is when Palpatine does the final whisper in her ear, this is where Valorum's strength will fade and he'll get lost with the bureaucrats, as I say, just everything's a committee, 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 and so she causes that vote. And I think it's a very effective scene that actually does kind of the opposite of what people are kind of complaining about. People act like this movie is just that scene over and over and over again. When in fact they really only have that scene once to purposefully get around the fact that it could be boring to focus on that. Uh, and instead it's actually sort of like kind of action-y style politics where stuff is happening fairly quickly. We just quickly get informed. Uh, Palpatine is actually up to be the next Chancellor and then find out at the end that he is the Chancellor. So he's gotten his way, big man big maneuver from him. So politics, no problem from me. Next up, midichlorians. Again, I've never had a problem with midichlorians because I think the explanation that is given in this movie about what midichlorians are is kind of fundamentally misunderstood by a lot of people based on the criticisms that I often see about it that like oh it explains away the force I can't believe they explained what the force is and it's just these microscopic things and it's like no they specifically say that the midichlorians are not the force the force is still the energy field explanation that was given in like the original trilogy this is just the explanation of like how it is that way in a, in a way that living things are connected to the force because they all have midichlorians. Midichlorians need living things to exist and um, uh, midichlorians need living things to exist and living things need midichlorians to be able to you know, be part of the force and then if you have enough of them to be able to sense, interact with and use the force and then the more midichlorians you have the more powerful you are in the force. So I think it's a it's a good explanation about just in this era where you do have a lot of Jedi around, you do need an explanation for why people can be Jedi, but then people can be not like not Jedi, not be force sensitive. And why is that the case? And that like, I think it's better to give an explanation than just to leave it as it's a mystery completely. It's just random as to like, if you can use the force or not. It doesn't go so in depth that it explains everything about the force, but it just gives you the answer that is fairly obvious. How do you test, confirm someone 100% for sure is force sensitive? And from from a blood sample, you can get their midichlorian count. And it, it was, it's simple and it gets across the idea of this is why Anakin is so important. He has a high midichlorian count, it's actually above Yoda's. And then with the mis mystery around like his birth of like Shmi Skywalker says, there was no father. And Qui-Gon believes her because she's such presented as such a normal person, just this caring woman, caring for her son, uh, doing what she can given that they're slaves on this, you know, backwater planet. Um, why would he have any reason to doubt her? And he believes it and connects it to the prophecy of the Chosen One. And in that sense, I think you, you needed some of that background to explain that. Otherwise, it's just, without midichlorians, you're just basically being like, oh, Anakin is force sensitive because he has got good reaction times I think he's the one and it's just like I, I think without over explaining it it helps to, to give details again if you want more explanation of midichlorians read Darth Plagueis excellent book probably the best ever Star Wars book uh, it goes into depth on a lot of details around that sort of stuff that really helps you to better understand the concept and so on 
that said, I do think the explanation given here is fine. And anyone who says that, like, this movie explains the Force is wrong. It just explains what midichlorians are and how they relate to the Force. Um, I suppose the other common criticism is just Jar Jar in general. And again, I don't have a problem with Jar Jar. Um, I found myself actually re-watching it here, like I said, for the first time in a few years. And really enjoying pretty much all of Jar Jar's scenes. I... I don't mind the, the idea of like, he, he's meant to be a clumsy character purposefully. So it's not this case of like, he's super serious and then he's all of a sudden goofy. He's, he's like this the full time. And because of the way they characterize like Gungans in general, they're all a little bit sort of like laid back to a certain degree and not overly serious. There's always a, a bit of like enthusiasm to them all. Here is like someone clumsy and like taken to the sort of next degree. Like, there's one or two scenes where I think it's a little excessive, like the um, the scene where he catches his tongue and the uh, kind of power binder thing of the, the pod racer where he's helping to, like, fix it. They linger on that a little bit too much, but for the most part, I actually like how Jar Jar is used in this movie in that I think he does stand out as, like, a notable, like, supporting character in a Star Wars movie. I think the the sequel trilogy has sort of highlighted that it's 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 harder than you think to do a good supporting character where you don't have a lot of time to develop them. And in the grand scheme of things, Jar Jar is actually fairly well developed of like, you get his backstory. He was banished from the Gungan city for being clumsy. And because the Gungans are sort of isolated from humans, he's in this odd situation where he's just sort of out on his own completely. And he just happens to come across Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan and ends up inadvertently like helping to repair the kind of ecosystem in a way on um, Naboo by bringing humans and Gungans back together, ending that sort of uh, feud between them and uniting in peace. And it is ultimately all because of Jar Jar and, and like him somehow finding a way to just talk to the right people, say the right things and just um, get a bit of talk going. The fact that he mentions the Gungans have an army and that's why the Queen goes to the, the, the Gungans to beg for help and the fact that it seems like on the Gungan side of things they think that the humans like look down on them and so you know Padme making the, the choice to sort of you know be very reverent towards the Gungans like bow down before them like we need your help. It's a big moment and he accepts that and it's it's not that Boss Nass was this overly complicated character. He just wanted to see a little bit of respect from the humans towards the Gungans. And he's a really nice guy otherwise. Again, it, it kind of highlights the sort of chill, laid-back aspect of most of the, the Gungans. The fact that Boss Nass, who's the leader, is perfectly willing to just talk to Jar Jar. And like, oh, you be the general for this thing. Even though, like, you crashed my he head libber and got banished the other day. And, like, the fact that... Jar Jar knows Captain Tarpoles well enough to like tar talk to him, like the, the, the captain of the army, like Jar Jar just happens to know him. Um, and the captain's just like, no, not you again. And it's, it's, it's fun. Like it, the Gungans are a fun species, I think is what stands out. And it, it's one of those things where from a world building point of view, there's, I don't think there's that many species in Star Wars that we have that are, that are kind of better developed um, from that kind of world building perspective, the idea that here's an aquatic species that can also go on land, they have underwater cities, um, we see the, the, their architecture underwater, we see the, what their technology is like, what their weaponry is like, the fact that they have this sort of plasma balls, the boomas, um, and the fact that that links into Naboo, where their main resource is plasma, and Gungans use it one way, humans use it mainly just for kind of power, as we see, during the fight with Darth Maul, they fight basically through the sort of power generator section of the palace. And um, that's really cool world building to link it together, that they're both from the same planet, but have different approaches to things. One more modern kind of human, you know, doing what they need to, and then one more sort of biological, doing sort of more simplistic way. Um, and I think it all builds up to a very nice battle at the end that has the same sort of tone uh, and style as like the Ewoks versus the Empire in episode 6. But I think it's a little bit better done because it's a little bit more realistic. That a Gungan versus a battle droid, you can see how the Gungan could take down that droid. 
especially with weapons that specifically target droids, like the, the plasma happens to be very good against uh, mechanical things. And the, the only reason that they lose is because, you know, they're, they're a bit down on technology, they're down on numbers, and they maybe haven't had as much of a chance recently to be experienced in battle, whereas the droids are, of course, just programmed, and there's, there's no real doubt there. And I, I think it works that you, you have the Gungans just showing their sort of, the sort of species charisma that they have of, like, doing things in their way, and Jar Jar, um... I think Jar Jar really highlighting the fact that, like, he is such an oddity on the battlefield and it contrasts so well with the programmed rigidity of all the droids that he's just, like, ending up, like, wrecking havoc on the battlefield by pure accident but making stuff happen. They still ultimately get, you know, rounded up and captured at the end until the droid control ship section of things goes well. But it all comes to a pretty nice ending here of, like, yeah, like, you you sort of see that little bit of a friendship between, you know, Jar Jar and Captain Tarples, um, and so on. And then by the end, the ending scene of the movie, it doesn't forget that it was a key point of this, that the two sides of Naboo came together. So ending on the big Naboo celebration of peace between the humans and Gungans, and Boss Nass lifting up the peace orb, and uh, the cool celebration music happens as everything kind of comes to an end. That's to me, pretty good storytelling using world building to your advantage, which is probably the one thing that they really haven't done in the sequel trilogy. None of the planets we went to have really stood out necessarily for like being overly unique. None of the species that we've seen, again, have stood out all that much. It's just been, we'll go here to do this, then we'll go here to do this. Nothing particularly unique about the planets. Naboo, Gungans, really, really stands out. The fact that even the Nemoidians as being the sort of, um, leaders of the Trade Federation kind of stand out as a sort of unique species. Um, with Watto, we get introduced to the idea of like Toydarians and the fact that the mind tricks don't work on them. And again, Watto, I think, is a very good minor character. He stands out, is unique. You remember his lines because he has, you know, a unique approach, but he also has a little bit of depth of like, He's kind of obsessed with gambling, but he also is the like the owner of you know um, uh, Shmi and Anakin. But then there, there's a slight sense that like he does actually, despite like being of course his like slave owner, he does sort of care for Anakin. And, like he 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 cares of course because he helps his business because he acknowledges Anakin's talent. But you know the little moments like he where he, he lets Anakin go home early and stuff like that. It's just like he's not just this out and out villain. He's just doing what he needs to do on his planet where, you know, he's in this position, he has all this junk, he has these parts, he's going to get what he wants from it. And, I, and I, I think it's stuff like that that really stands out. He is a character. He's not just there to be the plot, basically, for a little bit. He is a character to himself and is taken down by his obsession with gambling and he lets sort of Qui-Gon sort of trick him a little bit. So, um... I think Watto was well done, and then just the fact that we get to go to Tatooine again, but we don't just go back to the same places from the originals, we go back to a different section and get to learn different things about Tatooine, about sla slaves, but we also see that they're still like Tusken Raiders, so there's so, so, some stuff that's similar, some stuff that we're learning new about Tatooine, about the pod racers, here's, you know, a different hut, but also we get to see Jabba as well. Like, that stuff all, I think, comes together very very well and then the the Padre scene itself like I think tends to get a little bit of criticism um but I, I like it as a sort of different action set piece of the movie in that it's it's a proving point for Anakin and it's like the setup is that he's talented he's a he's a pilot but he's never been overly successful in these pod races before because the others have used kind of bad, um, harsh tactics on him and you can get a sense that, like, maybe he hasn't fully just put it all together. He, like, he's always been, you know, his, his ship has maybe been, a, his pod racer has been a little bit unreliable. He's still gaining experience actually doing the sport. But what he gets right in this moment is that he's doing it for other people. And that's that really nice conversation that um, Qui-Gon and Shmi have about the fact that, you know, like, he helps other people even if he, like, doesn't get anything from it himself and she just knows that that's just the way that the two of them are 
And I think that really stands out that he kind of wins this time and it goes all right for him because he's doing it for other people. And I think that's really, really cool. And the fact that he sort of, Qui-Gon sort of surprises Anakin by the fact that like you won, but like you also won your freedom here. I tried, but I couldn't get your mother free. But you're, you, you now have the option in your life to kind of go where you want. <coughs> and I suppose this brings up the idea of like a lot of people criticize Jake Lloyd for his acting performance here and I think for me like somewhat unfairly because I think he does a pretty good job for a very complicated role here where he has a lot of things to do. He has to have these emotional moments with his mother a lot like he has to say goodbye to her. He has to you know present a lot of the sort of technical sides of himself of like d doing the sort of more physical things of like fixing stuff, the pod racer scene and um, but also, you know, he has a scene where he speaks Toydarian to to Watto, and like that, that that's a that's a different thing. Uh, he's involved in some of the action sequences, you know, again in, in the ship bit at the end, and has to have like a unique dynamic with like Qui Gon uh, as well, and so on. And, and I, I think it, it comes together well. Is it the best acting performance you've ever seen? No, but I think it absolutely does the job that is needed for this movie. And. In terms of getting across the fact that there, there's character development here for Anakin, he, you, you immediately get the idea he cares so much about the people he's close to. In this case, primarily his mother, and you can immediately see it's going to be a problem. How tough it was for him to say goodbye to her, the promise that he would come back to free her, and the fact that he, he ultimately is not going to have that much control over that. And we'll see in Episode Two what happens with it. And the Jedi Council acknowledge that that. This isn't just a case of, oh, he cares for his mother, that's a problem. They sense fear to the point where it is a problem with him, and I think that's really well done with Anakin, of like, that is his problem. When he cares about something, he cares about it so much that it, it goes above everything. And it's set up here even with eight-year-old Anakin, so I really, really like that. You know, the, the prophecy of the Chosen One coming into play here, that... Ultimately, you know, the prequel trilogy is the origin story of Darth Vader, because Darth Vader is ultimately the chosen one in the end. He's the one who kills the Emperor. We'll see how Episode Nine attempts to, if it even touches on the whole chosen one plot point and stuff like that. I, I, I'm, that's where I'm very skeptical about Nine, if, like, they're really going to, like, reference everything. Because, like, if Anakin doesn't appear at some point in Episode Nine, it's kind of like, what are we doing here? Because that's the entire point. Six movies, kind of, it's his story. There's a reason in the first episode, the character we meet as a kid is Anakin, Darth Vader. There's a reason that's important. Um, so yeah, yeah, the, the, like the, the world building in this, I think, is fantastic. Like, just the fact that they, they tell us a little bit about the Force, but not a massive amount. Um, the planets that we go to, the species that we get to see, all sort of stand out as being somewhat unique. We get to see more Jedi around and see what they're normally like. And it's such a cool moment where we get to go to Coruscant. Here is the sort of capital of the Republic, like this city planet. And here is the Jedi Temple. What a cool moment. Like, it, 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 it's, it's, it's easy to forget how important this scene was at the time. That, you know, we, we'd barely seen any Jedi over the course of, like, all these other movies in the build-up to this. Then we go in and we see, here's the Jedi Council the top Jedi in the entire order. All of these characters are incredibly powerful, like Obi-Wan level, Luke level. There's Yoda sitting at the center of the council. Mace Windu, like second in command. The respected, you know, Kiadi Mundi, uh, Plo Koon, Oppo Rancis, this, um, Yariel Poof, Yaddle, who's another person of uh, Yoda's species. It all like just stands out that like all these different species and they're all Jedi. You don't get to see them all in action in this movie, but just seeing them all like sensing stuff using the Force, kind of speaking the way that like Obi Wan at points did in the originals. It's so cool to see that here during the the, the testing of Anakin. And um, I suppose yeah, we'll, we'll get into some of the action here as we come to the end of the video here. Like I think this is where it stands out the most. The lightsaber combat is just I think phenomenal in this, and I I think. What I, I, I don't get how they went from having the best lightsaber combat they've ever had in Star Wars to having some of the worst that we've seen in the sequel trilogy. Why can someone not just like look back on these movies and try to do it that way? 
is, is, has Nick Gillard gone missing or something like that? Can we get him back to do some choreography on these fights? Because we need to get back to this. Like, I, I think the duel at the end with Obi-Wan, Qui-Gon and Darth Maul, it probably is the best lightsaber fight in the franchise in terms of like the, the, the main movies. Um, because the, the choreography is so good, it tells such a great story, like it has a conclusion. Um, it's not just one of these fights that is cool, but then nothing happens with it. Um, the fact that it's this journey through the palace to the end, the story that it tells of like uh, Darth Maul being so much more skilled at like um, fighting Jedi than they are used to fighting like Sith. The the fact that he uses like Obi Wan's like exuberance to his advantage and is constantly like sending him flying back. And so even though Obi Wan's super energetic, he's constantly being pushed back and has to catch up with the fight again. And Qui Gon doesn't fall for Darth Maul's tricks initially and is staying in the fight the entire time, but is getting tired out. And then eventually, in a more cramped situation where he can't do his big broad moves and flip around a lot, that's where Darth Maul gets the advantage and beats Qui Gon. And the setup with, with that kind of corridor with the kind of laser beams is so cool. The fact that Obi Wan is watching behind the last one, he just missed out on getting through. Could have changed everything in Star Wars if he had got through and they were able to fight two on one at the end. But he has to watch his master die. And then he comes at uh, Darth Maul like a house on fire. That's probably the best like sequence of lightsaber fighting we see in the movies. Of just that really quick Ewan McGregor, Ray Park sequence where they just do so quick. Uh, he breaks Darth Maul's lightsaber in half. Darth Maul comes back and it sets up the, you know, Obi-Wan hanging, hanging down the shaft. And it, it's fun to look back on it and be like, Obi-Wan gets a victory in a lightsaber fight uh, from the high ground, but also from the low ground. And it's, it's, it's really cool just the fact that it, it's also a little bit of a reference to like Luke catching the lightsaber that R2 shoots out and um, Obi-Wan using uh, his master's lightsaber <clears throat> in the end to kill Darth Maul or uh, seemingly kill Darth Maul obviously it's canon that he does end up surviving this um, although he's like missing for the next couple of years basically until he's found in the Clone Wars but still you know the, the victory goes to Obi-Wan in this fight and it's it's cool because this is his journey. He, he goes from being Padawan to being a knight. He has to take on the responsibility that Qui-Gon left to him. And his last request was to train the boy. There's all this conflict in the movie between Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon about if you just do things the right way, you'd be on the council. If you weren't so roguish and constantly doing stuff like picking up all these life forms. Like Qui-Gon is the reason Jar Jar comes with them. Qui-Gon is the reason Anakin comes with them. And Obi-Wan doesn't necessarily agree with that, but I think in the end, he he accepts, you know, a little bit of that roguishness from uh, Qui-Gon, and it makes him like a better Jedi going forward, that he's not just going to do things completely by the books. Uh, and the fact that, like, at the end of the movie, he's like, I will train him even if you, even if the council disagrees. That's the element of Qui-Gon that's sort of left in him, and I... And I, I do really like that because Obi-Wan is your ma main like focus in a way in terms of like your connection from the originals to the new one. And it's it's so fun to see that it is clearly him, but it's such a younger version. And then uh, there's so much praise I can heap on Qui-Gon as a character for just being this like, if he had survived this movie, I think it's so clear things would have turned out differently. That's the sort of character he is in terms of like changing things. And, and his death here is such an important moment in terms of this is Qui-Gon's death is kind of I think what opens up Anakin to the sort of manipulation of Palpatine. I think it's sort of clear that if Qui-Gon was around, Anakin probably wouldn't have been able to be as influenced by Palpatine as he was. Um, but um, yeah, I, I'm pretty much gonna you know bring it to an end here. Uh, so it's a quick word on, on Padme. I really like how. I think this is what stood out to me in terms of something new that I hadn't quite ca caught on to before. She stands out as such a good leader in this movie, despite being so young. The fact that they reveal that, like, she is the one who comes up with most of the plans that she they go through with in this movie. The the final, like, big attack plan to go to the, the palace, get the pilots to the ships, and, like, go through to capture Newt Gunray. It's her plan, fundamentally. They, they note that, you know, Qui-Gon's like, it's a good plan. Um... She's leading the charge. She's right there with the with the blaster, you know, at the front, uh, firing back. 
Um, similarly, like her handmaiden, who, who kind of changes places with her a few times, is also there, you know, firing along. So I really like that they get across that Padme is a very good leader, despite being the young queen, as they kind of highlight here. It works for Naboo. They, they get these kind of, they like these young girls to be the queen, but it works for them because they give the young ruler the sort of respect. They have all these advisors, that's where like Sayo Bibble and stuff like that is uh, a character in this movie and so on. But she fundamentally is allowed to make those decisions herself. And I do really like that, that she stands out as being a strong character in this movie as well. Um, other than that, um, you know, there's, there's only so much you can cover in just one video, but like just getting across the idea, I really love this movie. I think it really is good. World building is good. It's got a plot that's different than the other movies, but I think comes together very nicely. Has a lot of great action with the lightsaber fights. The pod racers are kind of different, but unique style of action. You get an okay, I think, in space fight uh, at the end versus the droid con control ship. It's not the best uh, fighter fighter scene we've seen, like a uh, ship to ship, but it's 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 all right. And um, some other decent stuff on the ground, like the fight through the palace, is at least you know pretty cool. It's it's different that they're fighting through a palace and and so on. And then yeah, just a lot of like characters that are not the main characters who stand out. Watto, the Nemoidians, the Gungans, they, they all feel unique and different and I think we're, we were missing some of that from the sequel trilogy that feels like they specifically chose not to learn anything from the prequels and that was a mistake and they could have learned something from it. But uh, that's my review for Star Wars Episode 1 The Phantom Menace. In the comments let me know what your thoughts are. Other than that, uh, next video of course will be Episode 2 Attack of the Clones. That's been the video, thanks for watching and bye.